In 1999, I'm now 19. I'm going on legitimate auditions, but I'm still living in my parents' place in Ventura. And I'm working at a car wash and I'm bussing tables at restaurants and scraping by. And then a year goes by and I booked another pilot. I'm like, oh my God, this is the one. And then that doesn't get picked up. And I'm back to the grinding and grinding and grinding. I almost gave up. I thought, well, maybe I'm not cut out for this. Maybe I'm wasting my time and I'm wasting God's time. I'm wasting the universe's time. Now I'm quite literally experiencing the first real, real powerful taste of this dream I've had since I was four years old, essentially. So I was on cloud nine. It was wonderful. I wish to God, I wish I had anybody in between 20 and 25, grab me by the scruff of the neck and throw me into therapy when I didn't think I needed it and tell me, oh, you, you do need it. You, you have no idea how much you need it. And you're gonna go talk to a therapist and you're gonna work through stuff and you're gonna figure out, oh my God, wow. I had no idea these things were brewing. Around six is when I was just cognizant enough to recognize, oh, that box that we watch all of these you know, entertaining things on is a television. And the people that I see on this television that are pretending, they're pretending to be other people. That's acting. That's a job. Oh, I'm going to do that. I, that is absolutely what I'm going to do. In fact, I knew that I was supposed to. And I know a lot of people say these things and it doesn't always necessarily pan out for them. And that could have been my journey too. But I I, I knew that I knew, man, like I, I like genuinely on a, on like a, on like a spiritual level, even as a young kid, I, I understood that there was a concept of a God and that we were there, there was something bigger than us. And that I, and I believe that thing that was bigger than us also loved us and was very much involved in our lives and was incredibly powerful and had plans and, and you could be a part of those plans. And and I felt very convicted, like, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it, and, and again, maybe it's just because when you're a kid, you absolutely believe everything because you have nothing but, opt there's no thing that has happened in your life to shut your, your optimism and your hope down like that. It's not until later when you run up against wall after wall and, and, you know, rejection after rejection that you start being like, okay, listen, hop along. Maybe you're not as smart as you think you are. Maybe you're not as talented as you think you are. Um, and like I said, I know plenty of people who felt the same or seemingly they, they say they felt the same conviction that I, that I felt. Maybe we didn't. Maybe the, the conviction I felt was actually a whole other level of conviction. Maybe not. I don't know. I don't, I can't feel, I don't, I wasn't there when any of these other people felt whatever they felt. But at six years old, I knew that that was my destiny. And I did everything in my life to keep moving in that direction. It was, it just, I didn't really find theater, uh, you know, organized entertainment until I got into middle school because, you know, elementary schools don't really have that. And, and I was getting along just fine being, you know, yuck, yuck, ham it up, uh, class clown, Zach, that was enough to scratch my itch and keep, keep going. And I mean, doing voices and and sketches and making up new lyrics to songs like Weird Al Yankovic. And, you know, all that stuff was enough for me to keep on this path. And then I found theater in middle school and did a few things there. And then getting into high school, that was now not another level, you know, of, of really solidifying it. And then community theater outside of that. But yeah, I knew. I knew that. When that lady came up to you and said, you got it, kid. Yeah. Did you, did you believe you had it at that time? Or was, was that, was okay. that, uh, so was that like, was it's about time somebody else came up and, and recognized I mean, it, offered to help me? Kind of. I mean, <laughs> the, truth, the truth is like, I always knew, like I said, like at six, I knew, I knew that I knew I can't explain it. I, I just knew. You knew and you were good too. You knew it, was, it wasn't just like a hobby well, or something. No, 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 no. At six, I didn't know I was any good. I mean, yeah. at six, I was having plenty of, you know, family or family friends or whatever indulge me when I would be silly and, and do these things. Um, and so maybe in my little kid head, I had an inflated idea of just how funny I was because people were being kind. But by the time I got to um, 1990, you know, February of 1999, 
doing this play in Ojai and this wonderful woman, Maria Comfort, who, you know, was this retired manager. And she came up to me, I was 18. And yeah, and she says, you've got it, kid. And I, and I want to help you. Now, at that point, I had been doing theater for, you know, a good bit. Um, all, you know, again, all through middle school, all through high school. And all through all that time, I had quite a few people, not necessarily professionals, although some were professionals in the industry or had been actors or whatever, but I had many people. God used a lot of different voices in my life to keep encouraging me along the path. Not so much my parents, not that my parents didn't think I had a talent, but they didn't, they were just way, they were caught up in their own stuff. You know, if my mom and stepdad were healthier people and like weren't constantly like wrapped up in whatever all that drama was and had more time and bandwidth to really give to us kids and encourage us in our own, you know, endeavors. I think my mom would have seen it and believed in it way earlier and would have said, well, let's figure this out. I mean, you you love this like other kids don't love this. And you keep getting cast in lead roles of all these things and other people keep coming to you, directors or parents of other kids that would come up to me after shows. And they would very, I mean, it, and, and and I know it was God because it wasn't just some like, you know, just some a comment aside. It would, it, there'd be parents that would seek me out and they would say, hey, don't ever stop doing this. Like, don't ever stop doing this. You have got to do this. You know, it was those things that, Honestly, they, they kept me buoyed because there were plenty of times either between the chaos at home or as I got older and feeling like, you know, was I'm, I'm 18 and I'm like, why, what is, why are these doors not opening? Because I, I was doing this theater in Ojai and Ojai, California is this really artsy fartsy little town with lots of people who work in Hollywood. And I knew some of them and they, and they would see the shows I was in and they would be very complimentary. And yet doors weren't opening. I was like, what is going on? So, so I knew, I mean, I knew for years that I had a, a knack for it, a talent for it, a, an it for it. And I, and I knew it deep down in my heart in the same way that I knew I was supposed to do it. I knew that I had the, the right stuff for it, but that could still amount to a hell of a lot of nothing. If those breaks don't happen, if those little, you know, women like Maria, you know, don't come up to you at a foyer out of nowhere when there's 30 people in the audience some night and go out of their way to say, I want to help you achieve what you deserve to achieve because what you have is a talent that other people should see. And this, and it's something that you do well and you should continue to go and do well and get better at. Um, so that's, yeah, that's kind of how all that journeyed. And how, how did get, how did getting uh, the less than perfect gig which was your first sort of major television gig. Yeah. How did that affect your mental state one way or the other? Did it make you feel more uh, fulfilled inside or were you still kind of battling whatever was going on inside? Talk about, talk about that because I think well, people have this idea that, oh, you know, once you get successful then everything changes. And, and yeah. how, was that, how was that for you? Well, I mean, I was 21. Mm-hmm. I, you know, prior to that, so I started auditioning, like M- Maria introduced me to a manager who got me to a casting director who I mean, really, I mean, the manager didn't even do that work. It was the manager I was with at the time was setting up my headshots, but I had no resume. I had no credits. I had no nothing. So my resume or my, my headshot just kept ending up in these boxes, these the unknown boxes, you know, and this random casting director pulled me, was casting something and randomly pulled, pulled my headshot out and saw me for an audition and turned the camera off and was like, you know, who are you and what are you doing here? And how have I never met you before? And I kind of explained all that stuff about doing theater and whatnot. And then she got me to an agent who was one of the, I mean, one of the best agencies in Hollywood, uh, Endeavor, before they merged with, with William Morris. In 1999, I was I signed with his agents. I, I'm I'm now 19. I'm going on legitimate auditions, but I'm still living in my parents' place in Ventura, and I'm working at a car wash, and I'm uh, bussing tables at restaurants and scraping by, and uh, 
within a year, I had booked a pilot for a TV show, which was next level elation. Uh, but, you know, it, the pilots are interesting because you, you're right at the, like, oh, my gosh, we maybe we're going to do it. But the pilot is just a pilot until it gets picked up and turned into a television show. Well, that pilot didn't get picked up. And then I was right back to busting tables and washing cars and auditioning my butt off. But, you know, nothing was really going. And then a year goes by and I booked another pilot. I'm like, oh, my God, this is the one. And then that doesn't get picked up. And I'm back to, you know, the grinding and grinding and grinding. And I ended up, I, I almost gave up, by the way, I, which is in hindsight so silly because even to book a pilot and, the, and the, the, the success I was having was actually quite successful for a brand new kid to the scene. Like most people are, don't have that level of agent when they're starting. They're pounding the pavement every day. They're, they're barely getting commercial auditions. And I was auditioning for full on feature films and you know leads in television shows and i was and i was testing all the time and i was actually booking pilots but because the two of them didn't get picked up and because i wasn't booking a lot of jobs in between really at all i thought well maybe i'm not cut out for this maybe i'm wasting my time and i'm wasting god's time i'm wasting universe's time so i remember having this real heart to heart with god one night in my car i'm like do i need some i need you to show me that i'm not wasting my time because I, or, or your time, because I, if I need to be doing something else, if I need to go back and go back to school and figure something out, if I need to go be something else and do something else to serve this world, then let me go do that. Um, and I shit you not on the heels of that time of that prayer time, I booked this job. It was this cable movie that was on FX. So it was, that was the first thing I ever did that actually like saw the light of day and people saw, and I mean, we had a whole viewing party at my parents' place and it was a whole deal. You know, it was a small part in it, but, but nonetheless, and that was enough to buoy me through to the next pilot season and the next pilot season. The third one was when I got less than perfect and less than perfect got picked up. So I put all that context there to say, I'm now 21. I've booked this pilot. The pilot is picked up. I know we're going to go do at least 13 episodes of a TV show that I am one of the leads on. And I was just washing cars and bussing tables. And now I'm quite literally experiencing the first real, real powerful taste of this dream I've had since I was four years old, essentially. So I was on cloud nine. I was, yeah, I, I, it was wonderful. It felt great for my mental and emotional well being. Um, but I also was totally unaware at 21 of just how much damage and trauma was sitting in me. So, of course, it felt great. There was, I, I was, I was in a, you know, at 21, you got, a lot of that stuff hasn't really manifested yet. You're still kind of in this clueless time. I wish to God that anyone in my life, I wish I had anybody in between, you know, 20 and 25, grab me by the scruff of the neck and throw me into therapy when I didn't think I needed it and tell me, oh, you, you do need it. You, you have no idea how much you need it. And you're going to go talk to a therapist and you're going to work through stuff and you're going to figure out, oh my God, wow. I had no idea these things were brewing. Um, but at that point, I had no idea the deeper things that were, you know, going on internally. Uh, and all I knew was externally, I was very much succeeding in a way that very, very, very few people even get the opportunity to attempt to succeed at. So I was beyond stoked. Yeah. Hey, really quickly, if you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback. And back to the show. And behind the scenes, this is the period where it looked like the relationship between your mom started to go off the rails in a major way. Right. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Because uh, all of a sudden now, you know, I went from being her son who was struggling to break into mm -hmm. the business. Um, at which point she was already, you know, like in my ear, I should be your manager. I should be your agent. Right. Because I was you know, even... I worked for ZZ Top. Yeah, so exactly. <laughs> oh man. I work with ZZ Top. She would say, um, 
Yeah, I mean, you know, because <laughs> because even though I wasn't quite bro- broken into the business yet, I was still like auditioning for legit stuff. So I think she started to kind of see the writing on the wall a little bit. Yeah. And again, as a woman who did not feel purpose, did not feel worth, did not feel identity of her own in her life, this was the way that she could get in. And it was far more attractive than what my sisters were doing, which was, you know, still going to school if you're my younger sister. And if you're my older sister, she was, you know, uh, either, you know, bartending or waitressing or maybe maybe managing a restaurant or a bar, or, you know, but I was maybe going to, you know, I'm doing Hollywood. Hey, Hollywood. So it's like that could that that's a that's a that's a really cool, attractive thing that my mom might be able to kind of get her way into and then have this purpose, you know. And uh, and then all of a sudden I got the job and now she wants she wants to be a part of it. And she doesn't even you know, I don't even think my mom really knew that she was doing these things. Obviously, honestly, I, I think that so much of this stuff is subconscious, but I got the show. We're doing the show. It's got a live studio audience like most multi-camera sitcoms do. And of course, I want my friends and family all to come down to all the tapings and see it. It's so much fun. And I told my my parents, I told my mom, I told my, like, hey, you, you stay up in the audience. I'll come find you. I'll come say hi. At the end of the show, we'll all go have dinner and drinks afterward. But, you know, you guys stay up there. I got to do my job. Everyone abided by this rule, except for my mom. Because my mom couldn't bear not being down in it. She had to be a part of it. She had to have some of it for herself because she didn't have anything in her own life that was giving her that. She couldn't just chill. You know, like I, 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 I always likened it to like, instead of my mom, and you know, like I, I told my mom ever since I was a kid, I can't wait to be successful and buy you a house and do all of the, I, and I meant it. I wanted to, I love my mom so much. And I just needed her to chill the fuck out and ride in the back seat of the car. Take the ride. You don't have to do anything anymore, mom. You don't have to navigate. You don't have to drive. You just get to enjoy. Just sit back there and enjoy the ride. But my mom was, I mean, backseat driving wasn't enough for her. She had to barrel up there and get in my, give it up. I need the, I need to be up here. I need to be doing this. I'm your mother. I brought you into this world. I can take you out of it. That kind of stuff. And it just wasn't enough for her. She had, she had to get in there. And in doing so was insanely impairing our relationship because I'm a young adult trying to be taken seriously at work with a bunch of other adults, almost all of them, well, no, all of them were older than me. Everyone in the cast was older than me. Every one of my bosses was older than me. I'm the baby here. I'm I'm trying to step into being a man and my mom would be down on the floor regaling the writers with all of these embarrassing stories like how I wet the bed until I was in sixth grade and garbage like that. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? what are you doing and why are you doing it? And I knew why she was doing it. She was doing it just so she could get her way in there, just weasel her way in there. So then she could be friends with the writers and the producers. And then maybe she would then start to work her manipulative magic and be like, you know, I wonder, I mean, I, I, you know, I, 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 who knows what pitch she would have had. Oh, you know, I've done some acting in my day, trying to somehow find again, but in the pursuit of finding purpose, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just how you go about it. And my mom went about it so wrong so long so yeah and this right around then right when i started that show uh it was when i had to put the brakes on really because my mom would literally be calling me daily well in my dressing room and berating me calling me a bastard saying i don't love her because i didn't want Mm -hmm. her to be my agent or my manager or because i didn't want her to come down on the floor and be hanging out with my writers and she couldn't handle that and so she would in, in her way of then not feeling not loved, which was not me not loving her, but that, but that's what she felt. So she had to attack back. And now I'm in tears in my dressing room moments before I got to go down and make funny for all the people. I was like, this is not a healthy thing. I can't, I cannot abide this, you know, this will not work. And so I had to say, Hey, no more until, until you can speak to me in a way that's not this abusive and toxic, we won't have a relationship. And that was basically the beginning of what would then end up being a 13 year, you know, non-relationship. And then 13 years later, she, she passed. 
Yeah, I mean, you went into great detail in the book and it all culminates at this intervention that, <laughs> that your mom has for you and uh, which shows that she could also manipulate everyone else as well to get on her side. And then that's when you eventually had to cut her off. Yeah. Um, so talk a little bit about your journey. Again, I want to focus on the mental health aspects of being an actor in Hollywood, relatively successful, steadily working. Um, and then also managing, you know, the other things that you wanted to achieve in your life, such as being married, you know, having successful relationships, what was going on in terms of that over those, over that decade that you were now an actor and kind of had this dodgy relationship with your mom, but close relationship with your sisters. Yeah. I mean, you know, the truth is over that decade, I mean, I had, I had, you know, a few years after I cut off relationship with my mom, I was 23, um, you know, nearly 24. And I started dating who would end up becoming my ex-wife. Um, yeah. We met early on fireworks, you know, wow. Just everything. So incredible. Both wanted to get married young, thought it was going to happen. It all fell apart. I blamed myself. Uh, that, that definitely was the moment that I needed to go to therapy because I didn't realize that I was really just attracted to a version of my mom. I was doing mm -hmm. exactly what Carl Jung talks about in spades. You know, this is it. This is psychology 101. Um, and, we, and we both were on some level. We, you know, you're, you're attracting an unhealthy. If you're unhealthy, you are putting out your unhealthy vibes and you are attracting an unhealthy version of love to your life. And, but because that all fell apart and I blamed myself and I already didn't know at the time, but I didn't love myself. Um, I went into this deep, 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 deep spiral depression. Again, all, also started having some suicidal ideation at that point. Um, was able to pull out of it mainly because I was working. So I still had, I still had some purpose that I, I had to get up. I had to get up out of bed and I had to go to work. I had people depending on me and I would get dopamine when I went to work because I was accomplishing, I was doing. And I didn't realize until actually, even after I went to all this life-saving therapy, that I think really one of the biggest reasons why I've even suffered with depression on the level I've suffered is because of my dopamine deficiencies that I've struggled with throughout my life, which is also what's led to various addictions, be it through substances or, or video games or sex or whatever. These are all ways in which you're, you are trying to supplement your lack of dopamine. This is also, you know, psychology 101. Although things were only really starting to piece together right now. We're in such an incredible time in science where we're understanding, you know, how humans work and whether it's dopamine or serotonin or norepinephrine or, you know, pick your hormone. Uh, you know, these are all very important things and all directly relate to our, our mood and our ability to either be happy or not. Um, so I was able to pull out of that tailspin, but I never worked on me. I didn't know that I, I didn't love me. So then I, so sex became a huge part of, whereas before it wasn't really that much of a factor, all of a sudden I basically just became kind of, kind of, I don't know, jaded to love. I thought if this woman who I thought was going to be my wife and was the perfect, the perfect woman, if that's not going to happen, well, then I'm just going to go have fun and lose myself and in, in all of that and feel better. And you do for a second, you feel better for roughly those few seconds of that elation where you have, there's a girl that you fancy that you think is beautiful and that wants to give that to you. And you think, okay, well, then I must be, uh, then I must have worth if they trust me and want to, to do this thing with. But if you don't love yourself, that just immediately wears off and you need more of it and you need more of it and you need more of it. And uh, so that was going on in my life. Um, you know, my relationship with booze, my, my cigarettes, a uh, man, I, I went, I, 
in high school, I, you know, screwed around with stuff like this a little bit, but then I actually kind of went pretty straight edge and was like wanting to be much more responsible about it. And then I was, you know, after all this, I was like, there was just, just definitely a kind of fuck it mentality. I was like, okay, well, if that's, if, if I tried so hard and I, and I thought I was doing it all right, and this is the heartache that I'm left with, then fuck it. Then I'm just going to go live this other, you know, kind of life still being me, still loving people or trying to, you know, still trying to bring joy into the world, but not recognizing just how little to not at all that I loved myself. And so that all manifested in a lot of self sabotage and self destruction. Uh, cigarettes, man, I smoked cigarettes for at that point. I mean, I started in high school, I quit. And then once I picked them back up again, I mean, that was in 2000, 2004. And then I probably, you know, and I, I smoked all the way until I was 37. So that was, a, again, another 13 years at almost a pack a day and thinking, no, because I like it. No, not just because I like it, but also because I get dopamine from it because you do. And because I didn't love myself. None of this stuff I realized until I had a complete falling apart, which is, you know, what, what led to the book. And the, But that didn't happen until I was 37. So all of this time, even while my mom, my mom died. And I still didn't come to terms with all of the things that were haunting me and hurting me and all that. And for another couple of years after that. So all this time, you know, from 22 to 37, that 15 years was me not knowing that I didn't love myself and all the ways in which that manifested and me not being able to find love shocker, because if you don't love yourself first, you're not going to find it from somebody else. You're just not, not a healthy version of it anyway. Um, me not stepping into all of the bits of my career that I wanted to, because also shocker, if you don't love yourself, you're not going to have the confidence to really put yourself out there and stay on that and know that little failures are okay. In fact, even big failures are okay. They don't define you. You learn from those things. If you don't have any real self-confidence, like real self-love, you're terrified to fail because that failure is now telling you you're really worthless. You really don't have what it takes. You really are a piece of shit. So you don't, you don't have the courage to go step out there and do the things that are necessary to bring about manifesting those larger, bigger things in your life. So that was... That was, and it, and it just progressively got worse. That's ultimately what it was. I was continuing to work and I would continue to keep achieving things. God continued to bless me. I continued to get to do really amazing things, but it was still not ultimately adding up to the career that I knew that I knew that I, that I knew that I was supposed to be living and doing the life that I was supposed to be living. And I couldn't figure out why until ultimately, you know, I, had a complete mental breakdown and went to therapy at 37 and realized that that was the biggest part of the formula. I did not love myself. I barely liked myself. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.